Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. We are looking at the church at Ephesus part 5 tonight, and as you know, the various bulletins of the past got messed up a little bit because one week it got typed in the church at Smyrna, and so we had the numbers scrambled, but tonight is part 5, and we're in Revelation chapter 2, looking at verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight as we once again look into your word, we pray that you will grant us encouragement, that you will grant us strength, that you will grant us understanding, that you will grant us obedience. We pray, Father, that as we learn what the Word of God says, that we will make proper application, each one of us, to our own personal lives and corporately as a church. We thank you, Father, for your Word and its accuracy, its precision, and its authority. We pray, Father, that we might submit to the authority of the Word of God and in so doing, receive your blessing. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're still looking, as I said a moment ago, at the church at Ephesus, uh, because the church at Ephesus was a doctrinal church that hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So we're looking at the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. We're going to see more about them when we study the third church, the church at Pergamos. But what we've learned so far... In the letter to both Ephesus and Pergamos, the Nicolaitans are mentioned, but there's a contrasting emphasis, and I really want to emphasize that because the scripture does. There is a contrasting emphasis that's important to notice. Ephesus, the deeds of the Nicolaitans are mentioned, although Ephesus emphasized doctrine. But doctrine is what kept them from the deeds of the Nicolaitans. With Pergamos, the doctrines of the Nicolaitans are mentioned. Although Pergamos was involved with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Rather interesting. Doctrines lead to deeds. It's always that way. We've learned five things about the church at Ephesus. I hope you pick these five things up. Number one, the church at Ephesus was a doctrinal church. And we could spend a lot of time on that. We did cover some of it. They knew doctrine. The book of Ephesians is one of the two most important doctrinal epistles in the New Testament dealing with the sovereignty of God and with election. The other one, of course, is Romans. Number two, the people at Ephesus were hard workers. He doesn't hit them for their lazy, slack, lackadaisical attitudes. Number three, they wisely exercised church discipline. They couldn't tolerate what was evil. Pergamos did. And they tested people who said they were apostles and were not, and they found them liars. 
They exercised church discipline, and they did it wisely. Number four, they were reformed in theology. They obviously believed in predestination and election. And number five, they were clearly part of the bride, but they'd lost their first love for the bridegroom. And Jesus warned them that if they didn't get back to that, he says they have to repent. Twice he says they have to repent. You know, very little is preached on repentance these days. You're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay, we just sort of mooch along, you know? Just sloth through life, and nobody ever talks about repentance. Repentance is always necessary where there's sin. You don't need to repent if there's no sin. But if there's sin, you need repentance. And loss of love for Christ is sin. If you have lost that first love that you had for Jesus, think back to the moment you were saved. Do you even remember it? Some people say, well, you know, I just sort of grew up in the church and I, I sort of moseyed along and I don't know, really know when I trusted Jesus, but I think I trusted Jesus. And, you know, did you never have a passionate love for Christ? You may not be saved. Did you know you can come to church here for a hundred years and sit through every message and nod with intellectual assent, and you can still go to hell. Have you never had a passionate love for Christ? Or did you have a passionate love for Christ that now has sort of gotten tepid It's no longer like that first love. Well, you still like him, you know, and you still come to church and you still do stuff. You might even drop a tract around here and there. I hope you do that anyway. But you don't have a zeal, a passionate love for Christ. You see, the issue is not machinery and structure at Ephesus. The issue is love for Christ proved by obedience, not merely obedience in a mechanical fashion. So what was the key point? The key point that we learned on those five different things we learned from Ephesus is the loss of love demands repentance or death and church dissolution. And that's a serious warning. Mechanical Christianity with lots of programs can never replace love for Christ. The issue is motivation, not Machinery That brought us to the Nicolaitans at Ephesus and Pergamos. So let me give you a quick summary of what we've learned so far about the Nicolaitans. We started Nicolaitans back on February 4th. That's one final issue we want to talk about at Ephesus. And the Nicolaitans at Ephesus are contrasted with the Nicolaitans at the church at Pergamos. The doctrinal church of Ephesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The official religion church, remember we divided the seven different churches and gave you sort of what their characteristics were. The official religion church of Pergamos loved the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but they had lascivious deeds. Deeds and doctrine. Those two are always tied together. What you really believe is what you will practice. What you really believe will affect the way that you live. And we talked about how Smyrna is significant because it's wedged between Ephesus and Pergamos. And uh, Smyrna didn't have a problem with the Nicolaitans. At Smyrna, they're not mentioned. They apparently had not tried to gain a foothold there at Smyrna because they were going through hyper-persecution. They had at least one faithful martyr at Pergamos named Antipas, but there were apparently many at Smyrna who were killed. False doctrine does not last under extended persecution. It can last for a short while with brief persecution, but not with extended persecution. At Pergamos, the Nicolaitans had not only gained a foothold, but they became a curse to the church. Pergamos also had one extra spiritual pressure. Pergamos was the seat of Satan. We've talked about how Satan is a localized being. He's not omnipresent. He can only be one place at once. If he's in Moscow, he's not in New York. If he's in New York, he's not in Washington. If he's in Washington, he's not in Los Angeles. He can move quickly, but he is not omnipresent. Only God is omnipresent. Satan is a creature. 
But we find down there, they had one martyr who was slain among you, it says, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because I hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also, in other words, in the same manner, you have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So we better find out what that doctrine is so that we'll know what God hates. Because he says it twice. He says it up there with the uh, church at Ephesus. He says it here again with Pergamos. Uh, Ephesus had God's perspective on the Nicolaitans. God hated the Nicolaitans. Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans. But Pergamos did not hate them. They tolerated and they even embraced them. And their failure to hate. Do you get it? You know, people talk about hate speech. So does God. God says there's some things you should hate. You're not to be wishy-washy, not to be namby-pamby, you know, not to be sort of pussyfooting around when it comes to certain things. And one of those things is whatever this is, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans because it produced lewd and licentious libertinism. So that gives us a clue on the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, when we get to Pergamos, we're also going to talk about the Galatian heresy, but right now we're just focusing in on Nicolaitans. But there is something else that goes along with the Nicolaitans that relates to the Galatian heresy. We also noted that it's highly significant that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is paralleled precisely with the doctrine of Balaam. And we saw there's a lot of stuff in the, uh, the Bible about Balaam. So two things at Ephesus and at Pergamos. Satan obviously had a foothold at Pergamos. He lived there. But Satan had two things that he got at Ephesus. He uses different tactics with different churches. What are the two things that Satan did to Ephesus? Well, I talked about one of them when we looked at the passage in Acts chapter 20. Eventually at Ephesus, it hadn't happened by this point, they had hung in there all the way for the last 30 to 40 years. Revelation's written in about 96 AD. So Ephesus had hung in there for all that time. They were still solid, even though Paul had been dead for like 35 years at this point. But Paul had prophesied something. And here's where Satan got in. There was a leadership conflict that later split the church at Ephesus. Paul warned about that. He used different tactics with Ephesus. He couldn't get in on the basis of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He got in on the basis of a split in leadership. The second way he got into them was the one that's mentioned in the text. They forgot their first love. He turned their attention away from love and turned their attention toward works. They had great works. Two attacks. Two attacks on Ephesus. Playing down love for Christ. Emphasizing doing stuff. Number two, splits in church leadership. That's how Satan attacks doctrinal churches. We've seen both of those at this church. You know the events that led to the day that Dr. McIntyre came in to preach and the elders of the church stood at the front and wouldn't let him get up on the platform. Oh, and they had reasons. But it's exactly what happened at Ephesus. Repent. That's the call. Repent. So that brought us to the study of the doctrine of Balaam to see what his deeds were so that we can know what the deeds of the Nicolaitans are. I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols 
and to commit fornication. So we do not have a question about why what we see in Numbers, I just read you that passage briefly last week, why it happened. We're told specifically, Balaam taught Balak how to do it. He couldn't curse him, so he thought, what can I do to get the stuff I want? Well, let's think about the character of God for a minute. I've got it. Balaam taught Balak. It says that. Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And there were two things. Number one, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. We're going to talk about it when we get down to Pergamos. But Paul talks about things offered to idols, and there's no big deal. So how come Paul says it's no big deal, and how come here we have, in a letter that's written after Paul wrote about things offered to idols, how come here we have it listed as one of the two things that were bad that Balaam taught Balak to do? And number two, to commit fornication. You have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. <laughs> so the doctrine is mentioned here. The deeds are mentioned with Ephesus. So the doctrine of Balaam is set in parallel with the doctrine of Nicolaitans. So we looked at the passages dealing with Balaam to see what his apostasy included that ended in a grotesque moral depravity. And there are at least eight errors of Balaam. I hope you picked them up as we went through, but if not, I'm going to summarize them for you quickly. Here are the eight errors of Balaam. The first error of Balaam, number one, was covetousness. That's very similar to the so-called prosperity gospel of many charismatics, the Namus and Claimants, and we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter two. The second error of Balaam was his willingness to twist his access to God and to try to manipulate his privileged relationship to please another human being. Man, I'm, I'm in a position of privilege. I, I get to talk to the real God. And there was still knowledge of the true God back then. It's been dispersed over all the world because, world because everybody is a descendant of Noah and his three sons and their wives. So there was a residual knowledge of God and Balaam actually was still in contact. And we saw that many times in the text. It speaks about Jehovah. And we see he's the God of Israel. And he's the God who's saying, you can't curse them. You're going to bless them because I've blessed them. Balaam had contact with the true God. So his second error was his willingness to twist his access to God, to try and manipulate his privileged relationship in order to please another human being, Balaam, Balak, king of Moab. That's Numbers 22, 5 through 41. The third error of Balaam was trying to mix his privileged relationship with the true God, to mix that with witchcraft and secondary demonic supernatural powers. It specifically tells us that he sought incantations. That's magic words. An incantation is where you say certain magic words to accomplish your goal because the magic words are what the demons want to hear that motivates them to go do it. He tried to mix divine revelation with demonic powers. We're going to see all of these things show up when we get over to Pergamos, but I'm giving you the errors that we've picked up as we've gone through the text looking at Balaam. The fourth error of Balaam. The fourth error of Balaam was his pride, very clearly manifested in his desire for the honor of man more than the honor of God. Fourth error, pride. And you're probably picking up that there are a number of the seven deadly sins in this mix here, which was manifested in his desire for the honor of man more than honor from God. The fifth error is one that I think a lot of us have fallen into. The fifth error of Balaam was testing God to see if God would change his opinion 
if Balaam kept stubbornly insisting on a different answer to the question where God had already said no. You know, some of us keep hammering at God, and God says no. So we keep hammering at God, and God says no. And we keep hammering at God, and God says no. And we keep hammering at God, and we think, if I just hammer on him long enough, then I'll get a green light. We'll talk about that in just a second. Fifth error, testing God to see if God would change his opinion if Balaam just kept stubbornly insisting on a different answer to the question where God had already said no. The sixth error of Balaam, and this is very clear from the text, is Balaam was making God into a, a sort of limited territorial God because Balaam kept going to different places to try to find a better location for the curse or perhaps to try to find some weak part of Israel that God would curse. You can even knock off a few of them. It's making God into a territorial God. The seventh error, and this is very dangerous, I think many preachers have fallen into this, many elders, many church leaders, many mission board leaders. The seventh error of Balaam was his willingness to use what we might call his Bible knowledge. Now, of course, you don't have the Bible written there at that point. But to use what we would call Bible knowledge, knowing something about God, knowing a lot about God, as a matter of fact, using that concerning the holiness of God to accomplish what he could not accomplish through a curse. In other words, teaching Balak how to make God judge his own people by getting the people to violate the holiness of God. Willingness to use what we'd call his Bible knowledge concerning the holiness of God to accomplish what he could not do through a curse. He did by teaching Balak how to make God judge his own people. The eighth error of Balaam, and we see a lot of this in the church today, the eighth error of Balaam was the approval, condoning, and promotion of sexual immorality to accomplish his own ends. He had an agenda. And he thought, what can I do to accomplish my agenda? So he approved, condoned, and promoted sexual immorality. And there are many churches that do that because they don't have God's standards on moral purity. They don't have God's standards on marriage. They are condoning things that God says are an abomination. Now, we, I don't think I've said this, but I think we all obviously ought to notice it. Balak already knew about Balaam. Balaam didn't live in the same place Balak did. Balaam lived a long way away. But Balaam obviously had a reputation. And Balaam's reputation had gotten all the way to Balak. Balak is the one who initiated the contact with Balaam, who already had this reputation as a man who is in contact with the real God. The pagans had their gods, but they didn't have the real God, they had demons. Behind every idol, the Bible tells us, behind every idol there's a demon seeking to be worshipped. And the demons can do supernatural things. And so all the pagans who had rejected knowledge of the true God, and that happened shortly after the flood, where we find all kinds of things taking place, like the Tower of Babel, where people have rejected God. They've had a, a leader like Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter before the Lord. In other words, he was out there hunting for souls, we talked about that when we were in the book of Genesis. That's in Genesis 10. And we have the Tower of Babel, and we have the dispersion of the nations. We have the dispersion of the languages. People are scattered abroad. They had refused to obey God, who said, I want you to go out and you know, multiply and fill the earth. And they didn't do it. They all stuck in one place, in the plain of Shinar. God said, you're not going to do what I tell you to do? Then I'm going to bust up your system. You need to obey, or God busts you up with bad results. And those people went out. They had had a knowledge of the true God, 
but they began to look for other sources of power. Balak had sources of power, but he knew his power wasn't as powerful as the power that Balaam was in contact with because he'd heard about what Balaam could do. How do we know that Balaam was in contact, excuse me, Balak, the king of Moab, how do we know that Balak, king of Moab, was in contact with demons and was just thinking that Balaam just had a bigger supernatural power? It tells us very clearly in the text. We know that they were looking for witchcraft because the messengers who came to Balaam brought, it says here, a reward of divination. Rewards of divination. Payment for divination. Divination, that's one of those words we studied when we looked at all the words in the scripture that deal with witchcraft, which God, you know, hates and condemns and kills people for. Remember, we did that when we were going through the book of Acts. We studied all the different words that relate to witchcraft in the Bible. And that's what they brought. Numbers 22, beginning in verse 5, He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of the people, to call him, saying, Behold, there come a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth. They abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail. In other words, you know, Hey, we, we've heard, and we saw the verses of that last week, we heard about what happened. They crossed the Red Sea. Ooh, I don't know if our gods can do that, to split the Red Sea. Uh, we've heard about it, how everybody that they walked into, they, they you know, trampled them like a big machine. Curse them, that I may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land, for I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed. He whom thou cursest is cursed. Now you've heard that. You've heard that in Genesis chapter 12, but it was given to Abraham. Those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, I will curse. People knew promises to Abraham. That was 400 years before Balak says it in his talk to Balaam, or in his message to Balaam. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. They're looking for witchcraft. They came with rewards of divination in their hand. They came to Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. Let me make another obvious picture here. You remember I gave you eight different analyses as to what is the sin of Balaam. The second and fifth analyses are very clearly correct because God gave Balaam a clear statement on his very first appeal to Israel. So what were the second and the fifth of those doctrines of Balaam's of errors? Second was ba Balaam's willingness to twist his access to God to try to manipulate the privileged relationship to please another human being. We see that one in the passage I'm about to read you. And number five, the fifth error of Balaam was testing God to see if God would change his opinion if Balaam kept stubbornly insisting on a different answer to the question where God had already said no. So look at chapter 22, verses 12 through 14. God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, nor thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Did Balaam keep coming back after he got a very clear answer? Was he stubborn? He said, well, I know God, you said no. It wasn't like, thou shalt not, unless the sun turns green, and unless you can walk with your eyes closed. I mean, he didn't give me stuff like that. He told him, Balaam, the answer is no, period. Bottom line, over and out, no. And Balaam kept coming back. He stubbornly refused to take the answer that God had given him. Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. But listen to how Balaam reports it to the princes of Moab. Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land. <laughs> Let's pass the buck. For the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up and they went to Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. 
not exactly the way it is. Balaam didn't say, God said, and here it is. This is exactly what God said. Not, he just said, God, God won't let me go right now. He refuses to let me go. So they say, Balaam refuses to go. The king of Moab interprets that, this second-hand report. He interprets that as, I guess we didn't send him enough money. I guess we didn't offer him enough prestige if he would just do this. When God says no, the answer is no. Now, there's a principle that we learn from this. There's all new material. The principle that we learn is wicked people know that if they put enough pressure on you as a believer, and if you are a compromising believer, if they put enough pressure on you, eventually you may yield. Just keep turning the screw. Keep putting the pressure on. Keep putting the pressure on. Keep putting the pressure on. Have you ever known people like that? They don't give up. You say no, they keep coming back. You say no, they keep coming back. You say no. They're like those pesty little sand flies when you're down at the beach, you know, and, you know, they start to buzz around you to bite you. And so you run away. And they follow you, don't they? And, you know, the, the old trick, you, you hold your hand up because they always go for the head. And so they think your hand is your head. You know, they're that, they're that stupid. But they don't go away. You've got to go and dive in the water and get under the water and the, the sand flies don't know where you are, so they go back and look for somebody else. Have you ever known people like that? They keep hammering on you. And they keep hammering on you. And they keep hammering on you. What kind of people are those that do that? They're the wicked people. Eventually, they think you will yield. When you get pressure after a no answer to an unrighteous request, be careful. You may be dealing with a wicked person. And they're going to keep testing you to see what is the trigger that will get you to compromise. In Balaam's case, it was a combination of money and honor. In another case, it might be making your life easier or sex or something else that you really, really, really want. And so they know they found the trigger, so they keep hammering on that trigger. They know that eventually, if they just push hard enough, long enough, you'll yield. People who do that are wicked. And that's what we see in verses 15 and following. Balaam sent yet again princes, more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said unto him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Hey, man, set your price. You can have whatever you want. There are people like that. Come, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam give, gives away what he really wants. They say, you know, he wants honor, he wants prestige. That's what we're going to offer him. But name your price. And so Balaam tells them what, his, what really is it is that tempts him. Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. <laughs> hmm. Now that sounds like a pretty big offer, doesn't it? Hey guys, we're, we're in the stages of jockeying back and forth. What do I have to give? What do you have to give? What do I have to give? What do you have to give? You know, it's, it's that old uh, business, the business deal, you know, uh, where one guy walks out of the room and they keep saying, man, he walked out on what we just offered him. Well, he said this. Why don't we see if we modify our offer that maybe he will give us an acceptance. We know Balaam wanted the silver and gold in honor because Balaam came back to ask God again. God put Balaam to a test. Did you know God put Balaam to a test too? Not only is Balaam testing God, but God put Balaam to a test because the first time when Balaam came back on that, after that first no, and Balaam came back a second time, God said to him, okay, go. I mean, God said it. Okay, go. But you know there was something implied in that. You go ahead and go. And see what happens. You know, sometimes you think you have a green light. I mentioned this a minute ago. 
Sometimes you think you have a green light because it seems like God has said, yeah, go, go ahead. But when you begin to move forward, you suddenly come under God's anger. And at that point, you begin to do and say stupid things like Balaam did talking to his donkey. God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, God had just said to him, okay, go. So Balaam said, great. Gets on his donkey, heads out with them, and it says God got mad at him. He said, but wait, God said he could go. People, Balaam is being given to us as a warning in the book of Revelation and in a whole bunch of other passages in the New Testament that we'll see. God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyard, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. In other words, made it a little narrower for him. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place. There was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. The ass saw the angel of the Lord. She fell down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was kindled. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? God said, yes, Balaam went. God got mad. Balaam rode. The ass didn't do what Balaam wanted him to do. Balaam got mad. Interesting contrast between the two angers. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was kindled. He smote the ass with a staff. The Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, Only God can do that. It's not a demon that Balaam's dealing with. He's dealing with Jehovah. It's L-O-R-D, all capitals, in verse 27. Verse 28, And the Lord, all capitals, L-O-R-D, opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam this is really stupid. Balaam starts talking to the donkey. He's not even surprised. Did you get that? I mean, that is perhaps one of the most astounding, not that the donkey talked, but that Balaam talked back to the donkey. <laughs> and Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me. Ah, we see that Balaam has some pride. He thinks even a donkey can mock him. Remember, pride of Balaam, that was one of his errors. I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. So God says, okay, you want to see a sword? Here, try to take this one. And God opens the eyes of Balaam, and there's the sword. <laughs> Except it's not in Balaam's hand. It's in the hand of the angel of the Lord. You want a sword, Balaam? You know, come on over, try to get this one. Do hmm? you want to grab that one? God tells him, unless the donkey, who had more spiritual sensitivity than you, Balaam, imagine that, a donkey having more spiritual sense than you. You know, when we push forward on things where God has said no, animals have more sense than we do. How many times have you tried to push forward on something where God has said no? Be careful. It may take an animal to save you. Now would I have killed thee? Our time is up at this point. I know I normally could take until a quarter after, but the DVD recording up in the balcony only had 45 minutes on it. And we have reached our limit. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. You are God. You are the God to whom we are accountable. Accountable. We can't make it up as we go along. And Balaam tried to do that. He thought because he had a great spiritual position with you that he could manipulate you, that he could disobey you, 
that he could follow his own instincts and his own lusts because he had some human characteristics that wanted money and power and honor and the approval of people rather than the approval of God. He was a man who abused what you had given to him. He was a man who had a trigger where if they just hammered on him long enough, they would get their way, but he would get God's curse. Oh, it wouldn't be just a curse on somebody else, although he taught them how to do it. But there would be a curse on him. And we'll see that later as we get into the text. Father, help us to learn from this so that we don't fall into the error of Balaam, who is used as an illustration of apostasy as we get to some of the New Testament general epistles. Father, once again, we pray that you'll take your word and apply it to our hearts for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me find my hymn book here. Let's take our hymn books and let's turn to number 408. I think it's much in line with what we've talked about tonight. Having right doctrine leads to right practice. 408, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Let's stand to sing. We'll sing all four verses. <clears throat> 